I've planned an ideal city, a city that meets my ideal of the city of the future. Walter Bell planning a federal capital. Canberra occupies an uncanny place in the Australian imagination, in theory at least, as a planned city conceived among along utopian lines, both a bush capital that would amplify a unique balance between city and landscape and a garden city that would model new forms of community life. It should be something Australians are proud of, both as a representation of the nation as it is as a symbol of its ideals. In practice, of course, the opposite is the case. Canberra is widely uninvolved, unloved and often derated as the most un-Australian of cities. Australian cities. In this essay, I seek to understand the tension by examining the number of fictional narratives in which Canberra is literally or symbolically destroyed. This happens, as the title suggests, in Michael Simmons' children's book, The Monster That Ate Canberra in 1972, where a rather sad and appropriate short-sighted bunyip hungrily met munches on a number of iconic national monuments, mistakenly mistakes them for cakes and pizzas and ice cream cones. It happens in Peter Lyons, 1981, the China tape, a fictional history set in the future that details the Chinese invasion of Australia ending with a nuclear being dropped on Canberra. It happens again in Jeff Page's 1992 novel, Winter Vision, a belated Cold War fiction portraying the love affair between two middle-aged school teachers against the background of global military tension. The novel comes to an abrupt end with the destruction of Canberra in a attack. A moment the characters are earlier jokingly anticipate. Looking across the lake at Parliament House, I was just looking at, at Ground Zero, right there over the flagpole, two kilometres up for the greatest effect. It happens, or at least appears to happen in Andrew McGann's Underground 2006, one of the main examples I will discuss here, where give the three days warning to evacuate Canberra before it's blown up and a widely televised nuclear and finally, it happens in a more symbolic register of Marion Halligan's novel, The Point, 2003. My second main example here, when the restaurant that gives the novel its title, housed in a striking glass-walled octagon building designed by Marion Mahoney Griffin, that clearly functions as a symbol of the city's utopian visions, is destroyed by fire. While Canberra's status as a national capital makes it our prime target for a, by foreign powers, I believe that there are other forces at work behind the imagination Imagine destruction of Canberra. Forces immediately, if ironically, relate to the modern utopianism at form of its construction and continues to colour perceptions of Canberra. But before I go on to consider literally representations of Canberra, it is worth examining its utopian or origins in greater detail. Literary texts offer a privileged site to examine the complexities of the utopian impulse. In part, this very notion of utopia is literally in its origins indeed. As Ruth Eaton notes in her study, Ideal Cities, it could be argued that the literary form of utopia is the only one true. In its combination of the ancient Greek topos, place, and the prefix u equals our, not, but in English sounds like eu, a good will. Well... Thomas More's coinage might suggest both no place and place of well-being. For this reason, the word utopian is often employed to mean a turmeric impossible. But, as Eaton goes on to argue, this usage fails to do justice to the seriousness and desire for realisations behind many utopian projects. For Susan Buckmoss argues, the construction of a mass utopia was the dream of the 20th century. It was. Of course, these... These least two scenarios, destruction by explosion and destruction by fire, are the two very real elements for its Canberra local history. In the mishandled implosion of the Royal Canberra Hospital, an act in Peninsula on the 30th of July 1997, an event watched by a near-record crowd assembled around the edges of the lake, a young girl, Kate Bander, was killed and several other spectators were injured by flaring debris. And in the bushfires on 18th of January 2003, four people died and 200 homes were destroyed, prompting a degree of sympathy and support for from the rest of the nation that surprised some Canberrians. I would like to thank the Australian Literary Studies, two anonymous referees, for their helpful comments on an earlier draft of this paper, as well as the following for many conversations that influenced my thinking. Fiona Atkins, Stephen Barris, Bruce Bennett, Maureen Biddle, Adrian Caesar, Clara Foster, Paul Giannini, Marion Halligan, Susan Lever, Paul McGee, Frank Morehouse, Francisca Randall Short, Monique Rooney, 
Gillian Russell, Sarah St. Vincent Wells, James Warden, Gallery, Waterhouse, Jordan Williams. The essay was written during the period as a visit following the School of Design and Creative Communications at the University of Canberra, for which I'm extremely grateful. This line of argument is informed by Mike Davis's essay on the literary destruction of Los Angeles, where he argues that the city's actual propensity for natural disaster only takes us part the way towards the explanation of why Los Angeles is a city we love to destroy. Surveying 138 literary and cinematic examples of destruction at LA, Davis concludes that the abiding hysteria of Los Angeles disaster fiction, and perhaps all disaster fiction, is rooted in Iraq's radical anxiety. In a simple way, I'll argue that in Canberra's utopianism, and in particular the radical anxieties that underpinned it, as much as the status of the national capital, makes it a target for a fictional acropolis. So the driving force of the industrial modernization in, in both its capitalist and socialist forms. If the construction of Canberra can be seen as an exemplary case of the modern utopias project, then reading literary fiction may be privileged means to understand the contradictions of the heart of the utopian version and the grounds for the perception of its failure in practice. Kate Rigby's article, Not by Design, Utopian Moments of the Creation of Canberra, extensively analyzes the sometimes contradictory utopian impulses that informed the design of the national capital. In particular, it was guided by two apparently comp complementary assumptions, as summarised by Ken Taylor. The first was that a vigorous Australian national identity existed and that it was related to the idea of the Australian landscape itself and that it could be symbolised in the layout of a capital city. The second was the capital city planning could create a better and healthier society, Taylor living with heritage Piscaresh versions. It's worth considering that these two ideals of a bush capital and garden city separately. In many ways, the first ideal is unique to Canberra. The natural beauty of setting of Australia's future capital was an important factor in the selection of site, with the new Minister for Home Affairs, King O'Malley, likening it to biblical promised land. Entrants in the international design competition were provided with detailed topographical, geological and meteorological surveys, watercolour and drawings and even small site models. Adaptation to the landscape was one of the primary criteria guiding the judges and the prize-winning designs submitted by Chicago-based architects Walter Burley Griffin and Mary Mahani Griffin. It has often been praised for its attemptedness to lie of the land. However, there is no evidence that competition entrants were provided with information about indigenous cultures and practices that defined Canberra region prior to European settlement. Instead, it was generally accepted but erroneous view that the original inhabitants had died out with death of Queen Bee and woman Nellie Hamilton in 1897, Jackson Nikato. As Rigby comments, the Griffin's sensitivity to the landscape was based not in a lived experience or cultural tradition but on conventions of the land surveying picturesque representation which are ultimately bound up with the objectification and the commodification of the earth in modern, modern area, as well as with the design appropriation of the dwelling places of colonialist, colonialist people, not, not by design. So the Griffin city layout follows the contours of the land, the presence of the bush and the bush capital is ultimately organised according to a logical uh, appropriation and framing being subordinated to the quasi-spiritualist geometrical alignment arrangement of circles and triangles. As Rigby notes, this creates a certain tension, perhaps even a contradiction with all systematic eco-utopias bound to wrestle, that is between the Promethean ambition to remake the world and the this egocentric ethos of our attainment to be given. This brings me to the second more familiar aspect of Cameron's modernist utopian and the notion that the 20th century new science of town planning could avoid the problems of the originally organically grown cities, create urban environments that would anger, anger, engender new forms of commodity life, as Ruth Eaton notes. Both the Greek polis and the Roman cytovus denote a concept of city that encompasses both physical place and the more abstract notion of the body. Politic and history of ideal cities is guided by just such architectural determination. The splatter models that are projected are indissoluble from the social and political arrangements to which they are believed to correspond. Their production is guided by a long-standing conviction that the physical form of a city can both reflect and contradict the workings of a society and the behaviour of its citizens. 
Inspired by Ebenezer Howard's Garden City movement, Walter Burley Griffin's designs for the residential areas at Canberra sought to provide a variety of public places to foster the development of close-knit communities. Moreover, Griffin's arrangement of parliamentary administration and mercantile public buildings in the Edith City area reflected, according to Rigby, a radically democratic agenda where, whereby principles of liberty, equality and fraternity were to be brought into balance with mutually reinforcing harmony, not by design. But inevitably, this kind of architecture utopianism raises the question of whether architecture and its design itself can be expected to affect socio-political change. Pro problematic familiar through this history of ideal cities, where the rigidity and uniformity of the utopian plan suggests a conceptual authoritation at odds with the devised particularities of human flourishing that is supposedly designed to engender. Eaton notes that the urtex of architectonic utopianism, Thomas More's Utopia, consists of 54 almost identical cities initiating a dangerous tendency of future generations of utopia and ideal city designs towards the global inform uniformity. This tendency reaches its high point with the modernist international style, a supposedly universal architectural language of rectangular functionalist minimalists that was notoriously insensitive to particularities of concept Context, whether geographical, cultural, or social, political, Charles Jenkins gives a very precise state for the beginning of the postmodern era. 3.32 p.m. 15th of July 1972. The moment where three of the 33 buildings in the Prout by housing project in St. Louis once acclaimed a showpiece of modern high-density housing design were demolished in a widely televised implosion. For Jenkins, the destruction of Pruitt Ingle which after only 18 years had become a notorious all-black ghetto, ravaged by vandalism, violence and increasingly high vacancy rates, marks the, modern, marks the day of modern architecture die. Critics have since questioned this mythology whereby Pruitt Igor was ta taken to stand symbolically for border failure of planned communities and urban renewal programs. Catherine Distal, for instance, argues that blaming the architecture simply obscures the symptomatic systematic local problems of radical division, urban decay, chronic underfunding of public housing, long-term decline of St. Louis's comedy that urban planning alone could never have solved. In the mythology of Prut Uyghur, there seems to be an intimate relationship between the promise of social transformation embodied in the architecture utopianism and almost inevitable destruction of its built from, first in part by its residents and later in full by the various authorities that built it in the first place. The destruction of Prut Ego appears to go literalize a fundamental ambivalence at the heart of utopian impulse. The sinister dream of Tabula Robasa that appears at both the beginning and the end of the utopian cycle. What Eaton writes of the natural world may be equally applied to the social world upon which architecture utopias are imposed. Almost all the urban blueprints we have reviewed represent examples of humankind's quest to dominate nature. In this way, they have all contributed to our increasing divorce from it. Tabula Raska has been rallying cry for these planners who, taking the delight in flattering uneven land and straightening rivers and reveling in order of geometry, have condemned and com attempted to master the apparent chaos of natural world. In considering the literary, literary destruction of Canberra, there should we should therefore bear in mind the destructive impulse that has the intimate element of the utopian ambition. In both its literary and architectonic expressions, moreover, utopia can be seen as both foundational and entirely typical of utopias in its literary gain. Wherein the first half involves a clear, critical demolition of the social and political status quo, where the second half, in its liberation of an ideal community, is founded on the tubula razor. In this case, the island geographically is isolated from the world, from the known world, where both human and the natural world can be entirely made anew. As Eaton notes, utopias are usually implanted upon virgin or raised soil. The destructive impulse might be seen not only as an unhappy means to a happy end, as in the old adage about eggs and omelettes, but force hovering menacingly over the utopian world itself, such that the failure of destruction of utopia is often an integral element of the utopian fantasy. Frederick Jameson, in his study of literary utopias, is very expectant about this. In a chapter of Archaeologies of the Future called How to Fulfill a Wish, he reads the utopian science fiction texts are essentially wishful fulfillments. Wishful fulfillments are 
After all, by definition, never real filaments of desire and have assumingly always been marked by the hollowness of absence of failure of the heart and the most dearly fantasized versions. Jameson goes on to suggest that even the process of wishful fulfillment includes a kind of reality principle on its own, intent on not making things too easy for itself, accumulating the objections and reality problems that stand in its way so more triumphantly and realistic to overcome them. However, the introduction of the reality principle apparently intended to give substance to the dream instead threatens to unravel the whole fantasy. James' analysis of the unstable and self-undermining utopias of Arkady and Boris Jukic's Roadside Panic 1972 and Ursula Le Guin's The Lathe of Heaven in 1973 as demonstrating the conservative undecidably for representation which affirms the foreground's utopia in the very same act by which it calls fundamentally in the question. This claim suggests that what he calls the desire to call utopia might be understood not by reference to an object, the image of a perfect society or a blueprint for a better one, but by reference of the desire itself, that the desire takes precisely that land cannon form in which desire is ultimately oriented not towards satisfaction but towards the maintenance of consistent tension, the desire to desire. Here, desire is understood neither as a biological need that can be satisfied nor as a linguistic demand that can be answered, but as arising as the gap between them as which escapes significantation. As Alan Sheridan explains, there is no adequation, adequation between the need and the demand that convoys it. Indeed, it is the gap between them that constitutes desire. Desire, fundamentally, in the singular, is a perpetual effect of symbolic activation. It is not an appetite. It is essentially incentric, instable. That is why Lacan coordinates it not with the object that would be seen to satisfy it, but with the object that causes it. The desire called a utopia may might be understood as a desire always to have a utopia yet to build, a desire for utopia will remain always on the horizon or on the drawing board. If utopias contain the seeds of their own failure, it's because utopias cannot be defined, cannot by definition succeed, because their success would be silence the desire for utopia. Thus, Jameson concludes, we need a nobler word for frustration to invoke the dimension of utopia desires, which remains unsatisfied and which cannot be felt to have fulfilled without falling into the word world and becoming another degraded act of consumption. We must assert that not only the production of the unresolvable con contradiction and its fundamental process, but we must imagine some form of gratification inherent in this very confrontation with pessimism and the impossible. At the very least, however, on the other path whereby the utopian text reflectively charts the impossibility of achievement and the ways in which to wish out tramps itself, may also be taken to a mode whereby a utopian wish is authentically registered. The purpose of this rather extensive preamble is to establish the intimate relation between utopia and destruction, a relation that operates at three levels. First, the geographical or temporal isolation of utopias have always implied a liquidation of contemporary social conditions. Second, as we have seen, the foundation of utopian words have typically involved the destruction preparation of tubular Rasa, and even when, as in the case of Canberra, the ideal city seeks an accommodation with its environment, the natural world is nevertheless conceived as an essentially passive and st static material to be shaped according to the dam's demands of the abstract ideal. Third, as a passage from Jameson suggests, the confrontation with the impossibility and failure appears to be an essential part of the utopian impulse, such as the imagined destruction of utopian worlds can be ultimately seen as one of the characteristic modes by which the utopian dream is kept alive. As for an ideal city that's simultaneously at the centre of political and administration power, Canberra's utopian project is perhaps more destined to fail than most, since surely one of the most persistent features of the imagined utopias is precisely that they no longer require the forms of political authority and administrative reality, rationality that Canberra so unattractively embodies. These two themes, utopian ideal and political reality, cannot be easily disentangled, but are in kind of permanent tension in the dominant perceptions of Canberra. It is no secret that many people dislike Canberra, or more precisely, it's no secret that many people take pleasure in voicing their dislike for Canberra. Most famously, traveller, travel writer Bill Bison finds himself in a small cinema at the visitor centre watching one of those desperately upbeat promotional films with the title, like Canberra, It's Got It All. 
but after a few hours wearying and disorientated experience of the city he decides to come up with a new slogan Canberra why wait for death this is perhaps the dominant trope in representations of Canberra. Canberra is a city of the dead. Canberra is dead, either because its streets are so empty that it seems literally uninhabited, or because only the people who do inhabit it are the living dead. Grey, soulless bureaucrats in the service of dull administrative urgencies. It is a perception of which Canberra's Canberrians themselves are only too aware. Responding to a 2008 survey that found Canberra to be Australia's least popular tourist city destination, ABC Television State Line program inspired the Green Transfer of oh, the Gruen Transfer decided to challenge two of the city's advertising agencies to sell the unsellable. One of the campaigns used to intercut shots of Baz Luhrmann's Australia, Canberra tourism promotions, and horror movies to present Canberra as a cinematic city of the living dead, menaced by flesh-eating zombies selling the capital. Or, to take another example, Helen Gardner's Joe Cynic's Consolation portrays Canberra, Central Pedestrian Precinct Grandma Palace as a ghost town, gradually reverting to wilderness. Men and women who work in the government department stride across the square with identity cards swinging on long chains around their neck, junkies slush winning in the phone booths, magpies perch wombling through the absent-minded melodies on the chair backs of the outdoor cafes. A space that should be busting with urban sophisticates is instead populated by public servants and junkies, as in the ubiqui ubiquitous the former makes Canberra a depressingly lifeless utopia. The presence of the latter signals another dominant trope in the representation of Canberra. Canberra is a dystopian, a scandalously failed exemplar of the egalitarian ideas of the nation it's supposed to represent. Garner claims that although Australians love to joke about the awfulness of the capital city, its social bleakness, its provinciality, its grandiose, curvish street designs in which the visitor strives in vain to orient himself, she herself had always loved the place, found it beautiful with its cloudless skies, dry air, and looked forward to every visit. However, with a new sombre promise to follow the sinister murder trial, the city seems to change its nature. When a titiously smug track city driver starts aggressively rattling off the list of Canberra's virtue, Garner must strife that desire to cut him off with her own linery of facts. Listen, pal, Canberra is the hard drug capital of Australia. Heroin is cheaper and more readily available here than in any other city. Its suburb of Fishwick is the porn video supplier of the nation. There are more bored, under-occupied tertiary graduates here than anywhere else in the country. Plus, the people who empty the syringe disposal units have stated that the fullest ones would be found in your famous Parliament House. Shit. So shut up, drive your gormless provincial bore. Ooh, that's bad. Two memes of Canberra a sterile, functionless utopia and grotty, dysfunctionless dystopia are brought together by a third dominant troop in the portrayal of Canberra as a self enclosed citadel of cynical, real pollock that is, ironically, dangerously out of touch with reality. Clearly, this reflects the broader suspicions of politi politics per se. But the contradiction and isolation of political and administration power in Canberra frequently creates, creates a perception of government as, at best, out of touch with everyday lives of the extraordinary Australians and, at worst, a dubious loyalty to the nation's national interests. In functional narratives where Australia is invaded, if Canberra is mentioned at all, it is usually as the power base of the politicians who turn out to be in, in, either incompetent buffoons or self-serving traitors. John Hayes, The Invasion, 1968, portrays the future occupation of Australia by the armed fictional South East Australia, Asia Republic, which, which bombs the coastal cities and takes over Canberra as its capital. Set on a remote cattle station, the novelty unstubbly creates the virtue of rugged, rugged individualism as opposed to political and administrative institutions. For instance, the cattlemen call shags government ducks because they are so bloody useless. The novel anti Canberra theme is given a further twist, however, when the invaders themselves begin to complain about the nonsensical orders being issued by Commando Ting in Canberra. What these various views of Canberra share is a perception of Canberra's failure to represent the nation as a blended bureaucratic utopia. It fails to represent the red-bloodied vitality of the nation as a dysfunctional dystopia. It fails to represent the nation's Elgatan ideals. Sorry. And as a remote 
and self-setting center of political power. It fails in its task of political representation, becoming a symbol of state authority rather than popular sovereignty. However, one of the most stubble and proactive analysis of Cam Canberra's utopianism appears in Jennifer Rutherford's The Graunch Intruder, an analysis of, of Australian culture through Lankian psycholantic theory, Rutherford argues that the fantasy of Australian good cancel, conceals various forms of aggression, both towards ourselves and others. A shorter chapter entitled Space Blank rehearses once again the troop of Canberra as a dead city, presenting a uniquely Canberra emptiness. The empty streets, the closed cafes on Saturday afternoons, the desolate parks where no children play. In a twist in Rutherford's argument as her contention that Canberra emptiness and lifelessness is actually embodied to fulfil Australia's fantasy of the good nation, this quality of emptiness is seized on by Australian from outside the capital who enjoy expressing disdain for this home of the un-Australian politics and public servants. Nevertheless, there is something uncannily familiar about Canberra's empty streets. Perhaps the disdain so commonly expressed by Australians for their capital has to do with the discomfort evidenced by the analyst where fantasy is named. Canberra writes the fantasy of the Australian good in the space, rendering visible fantasies of the subjectively that informed white Australian sociality. In other words, Canberra does succeed in representing the Australian good, but at a level of unconscious fantasy that may be disavowed, a fantasy of order, cleanliness, and a kind of discipline of hygienic satisfaction. This presentation of Canberra is unlivable precisely because it is so livable as a vivid illustration of the inner Evility of failure at the heart of the desire to call utopia. The notion that utopias not only fail when they fail, making life even worse than it was before, but perhaps fail when most when they they most succeed, silencing desire by making life so comfortable that it's no longer worth living. It is perhaps the fact that Canberra delivers on its utopian promises that makes it such a deserving target of fantasies of destruction. In Andrew McGahn's Underground, a satirical pol political thriller set in the near future, it is no surprise that the narrator, Leo James, a Queensland-born property developer, handlers and opportunist, never liked Canberra, but neither does his brother. The Prime Minister Bernard James, a grim, grey, dull, calculating and mean-spirited political opportunist, the very embodiment that would ha one would have to thought of the Canberra type, who, much like recent Australian Prime Minister, issues living in Canberra for the ground of visits of Sydney Harbour. Viewed in from Kirribilli, Canberra is described in the novel as quiet as ever, soulless, deary looking sleepy, empty and grey. The novel is presented on an account written by Leo as he is held captive by an Australian government of the near future that has outlawed confined minorities in ghettos, introduced worry blocks, checkpoints and mandatory citizenship tests. Questions include what was Don Bradman's batting average, 92, who bowled un under arm bowl and what well, was it legal? As a consequence of being the Prime Minister's brother, Leo is repeatedly kidnapped, first by a group of called the Great Southern, then by the Federal Police, and then by a group calling itself the un Australian Underground, a secret resistance like operation that is determined to defend what it sees as Australian values against the new government repressive security and detention laws and increasingly intimate alliance with USA. Isn't that like what we got going on now? Bill Spryson puts this in context. In 1996, Prime Minister John Howard caused a stir after his election by declining to live in Canberra. What made this interesting is John Howard is by far the dullest man in Australia. Imagine the very committed funeral home director, someone who's been burning ambition from the age of 11 was to be a funeral home director, whose proudest achievement was to be elected president of the Queen Bean and District Funeral Home Directors Association, then to have his personality at Harvard again, and you pretty much got John Howard. When a man as outstandingly colourless as John Howard turns up his nose at a place you must know, it's worth a look. I can't wait to see it. An expression, explanation is given in Halligan's point where the unnamed Prime Minister's wife will not allow him to live in the same city as his mistress. The founding trauma that inaugurates its future society, its, so to speak, is the apparent of Canberra by an unknown group. Three days warning is given to evacuate the city and then it was blown up in a widely televised blast. As the narrator observes, the joke afterwards goes, 
What if they blew up the capital city and no one noticed? That is, although the destruction of Canberra sets in a chain of series of increasingly representative security measures, the day-to-day -day functioning of the nation continues virtually unchanged. For a country whose capital has ceased to exist, we've carried on with remarkably little civil inconvenience. The government departments have established themselves happily in Sydney or Melbourne, right where they've always preferred to be. My brother, meanwhile, moved straight to Kirribilli House and announced that it was now the official Prime Minister's residence, which was not to suggest that it was Sydney was there, therefore, to be the new capital city. No, nor indeed was it to be Melbourne. Quite simply, there is no new capital city, a solution which neatly avoids the kind of pointless arguments that led to Canberra being built in the first place. And if the nation hardly misses Canberra or even experiences a strange relief in no longer having to continue with a failed experiment, the residents of Canberra are shown leaving the city with barely a backward glance. If ever a city was to be made abandoned quickly, it was Canberra, a mere 300,000 people spread across scrawling, spacious suburbs surrounded by wide, empty freeways and native bushland, and for all that city was almost a hundred years old, and it wasn't even a place that many residents had in history. And primarily, it was only ever a garrison town for the public service, and like troops decamping from a military compound, people loaded up and got out fast. Canberra is generally mourned by very few. Newt's barely mourned, not even memorialised here. Canberra literally becomes a dead city, as it has always been dreaded being. It is worth noting how the opposite seems to have played out in real life. In the reaction to the Canberra bushfires, where the national response of sympathy seemed to mark a belated realisation that Canberra is part of the nation and inhabited by ordinary Australians. McGann's novel is notable for its conflicting, conflating of Canberra bashing and anti-Americanism. Canberra has probably suffered from the perception that there is somewhat something suspicious American about it. For one thing, the constitutional requirement for the site to be located a certain distance from both Melbourne and Sydney followed the American precedent. For another, the competition for the capital's design was won by a couple from Chicago with a distinctively American design of geometric modernity. As Christina Vernon suggests, the very modernity of Canberra, the notion of the capital city that would be a modern expression of the nation's future ideals rather than a set of monuments to its heritage, had a suspiciously American flavour to an Australian population inclined to imagine its notions of culture and political authority in terms of sandstone and plain trees. In fact, the revitalisation of Canberra orchestrated by Menzies in the 1950s and which involved massive paintings of deduous European trees around the shores of the lake was motivated to a large extent by a desire to reposition Canberra, Canberra's aesthetic from American geometrical minimalisation to a British ideal of picturesque. But McGann's novel portrays a more sinister American influence at work in Canberra. The plot of the novel turns on the fact that nuking of Canberra by was in fact an elaborate ruse on part of the CIA, which fakes the destruction of Canberra in order to use it as a secret, virtually purpose-built home base for the operations of the covert global oligarchy of the world leaders from politics, big business, from the US president to the plot line is basically an assemble of various conspiracy theories that are part Canberra urban legend. The tunnel networks under the US Embassy, the secret CIA spying facilities hidden in the mountains around Canberra, and that's some um, echelon like Project Echelon, underground bunkers beneath Parliament House, and even the notion of Canberra as the capital city of the New World Order. I have heard that so many times, that Canberra is the capital city. At the climatic moment in the novel, the narrator, his underground captor, Harry, and fellow captain Aisha, travelling under the cover of night, cross Lake George and climb the summit of Mount Ainsley, and before us slay the supposedly dead city of Canberra, alive and well after all. The na narrator rebukes himself for not having recognised the terrain earlier, but is still unable to comprehend the evidence of his senses. Even if I had to work out where I was, I would ha only have assumed Harry was taking us to look upon the ruins of the dead city. Nothing would have prepared me for a living Canberra. Here, the troop of Canberra as a dead city is given a second twist, as it were, for it's not the Australian government's design of Canberra as officially dead in the novel, simply uh, punning retineation of 
dominant characteristics of a city in reality. But this conceit becomes a running joke as Leo's brother, Bernard, smugly reveals to him the scale of the operation, offering to save his life if he remains imprisoned in the Canberra protected zone. Obviously, you just can't let go. As far as the world is concerned, you died over a month ago, but that isn't necessarily a problem. Quite a few officially dead people are living and working here in Canberra. One. Here, here is an extreme example, but yes, so what? You let me live, but I have to stay in Canberra for the rest of my life? There are worse options, I wonder. The humour of the passage clearly derives from a sense in which simultaneously invokes the more familiar Canberra of contemporary reality. The sterile fun functionalist utopia, where life is not worth living. If McGann appears at first sight to mobilise a kind of paranoid dystopian in its representation of Canberra, in which the ideal city's bland functionalism turns out to be the ideal for the governors, not the governed, a deeper ambience emerges towards the end of the novel, when the narrator, imprisoned in a long abandoned parliament house, reads through a hundred years of Hansen, claiming, you almost feel behind the politicians and the rhetoric, the Australian people, many of the great democratic decisions of the narrator elaborates in his survey, of the first hundred years of the Federation happened. Of course in Canberra and the old Australian, he mourns is one of which Canberra was the centre of political and bureaucratic power. As Andrew McCann suggests, it is implicit protest that fi fictional PM Bernard James, a populist nationalism, is fundamentally un-Australian. Underground exposes the problem of political legitimacy in democracies. The question of when are the people in a quantitative or disruptive sense, really the people in a normal sense, if the apparent destruction of Canberra enables the consolidation of a covert global conspiracy, it appears to precipitate the collapse of a popular democratic resistance to the new government's agenda. Nowhere, anywhere, the narrator muses. Do I see Australian people saying no? In other words, Canberra emerges in retrospect as neither utopia nor dystopia, but as the nation's last balk against political excess. Soulless theory, unlivable and certainly unlovable, but the capital city we had to have. If McGann's narrator presents what is essentially an outsider's view of Canberra, Marion Halligan is a novelist who, perhaps more than any other, has dedicated herself to the evocation of Canberra from the insider perspective, capturing its sense of place not simply as a setting for political intrigue or national cal calamity, but as a setting for a distinctive kind of everyday life. The point, essentially, a loosely structured novel of conversation centers on a small group of characters associated with the imaginated iconic restaurant that gives the novel its title, and with the novel's central character, Flora Mount, the culinary artist who had made the point the best restaurant in town. Halligan clearly intends the restaurant housed in Marion mahogany griffin's design glass walled octagon sitting on the edge of the lake to function as a syndicate of canberra itself a utopian architectural symbol that had become dom domain of power and privilege the restaurant is a mirror it is a glass dankly it is an octagon from outside it looks like a lantern which lights itself but how far beyond its own space does it illuminate inside are those who possess, and perhaps themselves possess. Outside are the dispossessed. The dispossessed see themselves, and the others, the insiders, the others see only themselves. And, indeed, apart from the staff of the restaurant itself, Halligan's two main groups of characters repeat in strikingly similar terms to Garner's dystopian vision of Camel. The insiders are politicians, lobbyists, senior public servants, private industry consultants. The outsiders are heroin addicts, alcoholics who sleep rough over the heat, heating vents of the National Library. It is the spotless utopianism of Canberra that renders it so inhospitable to the disenfranchised. At one point, the homeless clothes muses on the challenge of keeping warm in the Canberra winter. This waterfront is so tidy. No newspaper or old art cartoons, no old rugs or bits of ray. Clovis, an educated middle-class father of four who embezzled embezzlement led to him losing everything and his companion in distress, Gwyneth, a teenage heroin addict, are among Halligan's most sympathetic characters. By contrast, the novel's malevolent forces come in the form of violent and nihilistic group of privileged young men, products, the novel suggests, of the distracted and neglectful parenting of the city's power-hungry elites whose influential collections enable their sons to escape conviction for a poor bashing murder. 
If Flora's restaurant serves as the glass darkly of a utopian version, corrupted by social diversion and exclusion, its lantern-like structure projecting the spectacle of privilege across the lake like a cynically broken promise, it also serves as the scene of a kind of an awkward re reproachment. Gwyneth sustains herself on the restaurant leftovers put aside for her by the kind kitchen hand, while Clovis drinks his cask of wine from the restaurant's wine glasses, discarded before their stems are broken. After Clovis' intervention saves the life of Flora jo lover Jerome in the poor abashing incident, Flora invites both Clovis and Gwyneth to dinner in the restaurant. A well-meaning act of reaching out to the have-nots that have not ex unexpectedly proceeded with the mutual awkwardness and embarrassment. But if the building itself is a symbol of a city, flawed utopian's vision, the food that Flora creates there also functions as a commentary on the utopian theme. Critics have recently recognised that the colony of food in Halligan's writing see Brain Jones. However, as Halligan comments in recent interviews, the thing is, I use food as a way of discussing social commentary, and I'm, often people don't see that. Flora, food is, is itself utopian design, not to satisfy a need, but to stimulate desire. The food is idea, an idea, carefully thought out before it becomes fresh, flesh on a plate. Food, she will tell you, about, is about desire, as is all art. In the river of our being is the confluence of the streams of the intellect and senses. When I eat, she says, I want to exercise my imagination, not my stomach muscles. Flora imagines writing a book about food that doesn't contain a single recipe, a book that is a metaphysical and cycle of factual, about food, but not about how to cook it, a book that reproduces a kind of intellect ascidium, embodied in Flora herself, pale, thin, perpetually reading and thinking about food, but barely nibbling at what is on her plate. Flora's cooking is therefore presented in a form of utopian art, a striving for its perfection that it is, like the Griffin's abstract geometrical plan for the city of Canberra, the antithesis of what Rigby calls an attunement for the given. An attunement exemplified in the novel by the, I can't say that, cooked by Flora's friend Eleanor, whose spaghetti is made of whatever ingredients you have up in the cupboard, the pastor of a working woman who has no time to shop, Flora's lover Jerome, a former Franciscan monk, whose des desire to desire has led him to renounce his life of reunification, muses on the quasi-platonic idealism of Flora's cunningly ambition. She wishes to achieve a perfect thing. She quoted somebody to me once, to the effect that even when what it offers best, nature gives nothing absolute. And she told me that when she was about was search for that absolute, that nature cannot manage. That's where her culinary art and her endeavour took her. There are words for these things, Greek words. It is not new this. Hubris, the arrogance, the insolence, to think, to do what only gods can do. Tragedy was the outcome. Wow, so much in this. Flora's culinary ambition thus carries the taint of hubris that affects all utopian visions, the impulse to make the world anew. Towards the end of the novel, as the theme builds towards the tragic conclusion, Flora begins to compose in her mind of a special dinner for the slow food movement, a predominantly European old world movement, celebrating quality and authenticity, heritage, animal breeds and vegetable varieties, local traditions and artisanal projects production methods. By contrast, as Flora is well aware, Australia's food culture has been modern from the outset. Nothing local, everything industrial, not a tra tradition to perpetuate. And that's the thing, you know, you ask Australians, what's our what's our national food dish? And we don't really have one. People go on the pie or the lamington, but we, that's, that's not, you know, that's not it. The challenge then is that slow food in this country has to be about involving ourselves. If it's to be about food as a symbol, an emblem, then it has to be an outward and a visible sign of the quite deep and imaginative plurality. In other words, Flora's slow beef banquet sets itself the same utopian and impossible task as Canberra itself of the representation of the nation, its reality and its ideals. In a panic about her menu, there's something missing that needs to pull it all together. Flora experiences a eureka moment when a bygone 
moth flies into her kitchen, she catches it, and then dozens more. Stuck by the idea of making moth cakes by roasting them on hot scones, just as the indigenous inhabitants of Canberra once did. In effect, reaching back to a pre settlement era in search of authentic local food heritage. Every spring, Bongan moths gather in their millions in the Canberra region to civiate the caves in the Brinder bells, bellows. The moths were a treasured food source for the various indigenous groups of the region. So much so that the reliability of the annual feast led to the place centred on modern-day action, Peninsula, becoming an important intertribal meeting ground. It was this tradition that gave the place its name, Nengambara or Kambara. So that's its original name, Nengambara, Kambara. Meaning, meeting place, and thus its appropriateness of the national capital. The annual return of the Bongong moth and its fitted symbol of the live, lived experience of place that was missing from the information prior to Canberra's utopian designers. As Hallingan's pr prologue to the novel notes, the moths are considered a pest in most modern-day Canberra since they swarm in their millions around the bright lights of the new Parliament House. However, when Flora attempts to recreate the food of the indige indigenous moth hunters, simple, immemorial, vital, it is a stone from the Mongolo River buried under the waters of Lake Burley Griffin that Flora places over her state-of-the-art kitchen high-powered glass flame. The resulting explosion sets off a chain reaction in which herself is killed and the restaurant burns to the ground. The destruction of the restaurant can therefore be seen as destruction not only Marion Mahoney's Griffin's utopian architectural version, but for four months, utopian colour and vision of rapprochement between the modern city and its indigenous past. The imagined destruction of Canberra, faked in McGann's novel, A Symbolic Halligans, is inseparable from its utopian premise. It is in fact a product of utopian desires. The underground, the perception of Canberra as a failed utopia makes it all too easy to abandon the city to its annihilation. Indeed, just as Mike Davis observes, a cosmic undertone of good riddance. When Los Angeles is destroyed in the Hollywood film Independence Day, so too is the underground there in a sense that, if only it becomes only because of its idol city hubris, Canberra had it coming. But the unforeseen cost of this abandonment is the collapse of the democratic representation altogether, ushering in the ultimate global dystopian, which is UN, with the officially dead city of Canberra despised and unmourned as its sinister headquarters. By the same token, however, the apparent destruction of Canberra also precipitates the formation of the covert Australian underground movement, suggesting a rebirth of utopianism from the ashes of the utopian city. The Phoenix. There's a lot of um, secret society stuff here. Marking the profound ambience of the utopian desire and its twin impulses. So the twin impulses is part of the Masons. Destruction and regeneration. In the point of Flora Mount, well-meaning attempt to recreate food with the indigenous moth hunters brings it to a sharp relief of suppression of the indigenous experience of the place that was a condition of the city's foundation. At the end of the novel, Clovis and Jerome contemplate the mangled ruin of the restaurant, wondering bitterly if the authorities will leave it as it is as a kind of memorial, rather than as it is more likely, clearing it away as though it had never been. Jerome himself suppresses the fleeting impulse to destroy the narrative he has been writing to work through his grief, suggesting that the act of memorialism in itself, the recording of a loss and mourning, is one possible means of preventing the reinstatement of the Tulba Raska on which the utopian dream is founded. Wow. Okay, that's really interesting. There's a lot of um, hints in there as to what's going on. And, and for so many books to be written about destruction um, is interesting. If you're interested in how Canberra is designed, I'll put a link in with the Burley Griffins and the New World Order and what happened. Cool. Thanks for watching. Bye now.